Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're so glad that you are here. My name is Galen, and I promise the room fills up. It just takes a little bit of time because everyone's eating breakfast, getting coffee, talking to each other. I don't know what they're doing, but they will be here soon. And we do believe it is awesome to be together. Yeah? Yeah, okay. You know, that sounded like more people than there's in this room, so I think you guys are excited to be here. I am too. All right. Um, we're going to get started. What I want to say off the top is that if you're new with us and you're on time, um, we encourage you to get connected to our church. There's information in the pews in front of you to get connected. Also, we've got Betsy out in the back. She's actually walking in the room right now, and she'd love to give you more information about our church. Um, we've put together welcome gifts for you. If you're new, we'd love to give you one of those. So we're excited that you're here. We believe God does amazing things when we're together, and that this is just a really healthy rhythm to meet spiritually for our souls to be together. So can we stand and proclaim God's name out, trusting that all that we've got going on, that it belongs to him, and we can declare that even in these songs as we sing it. Let's sing together. Sing when all I see is the battle.
this house of the Lord. I think we can do it. Let's sing together. There was a moment when the lights went out. And death had claimed his victory. His king of love. The king of love had given up his life. His darkest day of history. They're on a cross. They're on a cross they made for sin.
teach you a new song this morning as we continue to just give God all that he deserves, to give him worship, to give him our hearts more and more. So this song is called Forever Yahweh, and it sings the names of God. And so I've done a little bit of work for you and given you some descriptions to remind us what these names mean for us. Yahweh, that, that he will be who he says he is forever and always in the past, present, and future. This name Adonai, Lord, Elohim, which is a word that can be used in a plural way for many gods, but for us, it means that there's one God over all gods. El Shaddai, God Almighty. And what we sing during Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us. So listen to the song, sing with us as we continue to worship God with our hearts. Anna's gonna lead us in the song.
praise you this morning. I just stand in awe of you. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are forever worthy. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We adore you this morning. Thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may have a seat. I'm one of our pastors here. Um, yeah, I'm so grateful that we get to gather and we get to proclaim the truths that this is all about God. And, and when I'm scattered in my week and I'm, uh, my mind is divided and my heart is all over the place and I'm trying to figure out life, it is good to have this rhythm every Sunday to recenter ourselves on the goodness of God. Amen? Uh, in two weeks... You know, if you've been traveling and you've been scattered, in two weeks we're going to kick off sort of our new church season. Around here we call summer just the summer scatter. People are all over the place. We've got family visiting, traveling. Uh, but August 21st, we are going to have a kind of a kickoff launch again for the new school year. And uh, we're going to have outdoor services. We're going to have some baptisms. We're going to have barbecue after. O old slow barbecue is going to cater for us. So we need you to... Get tickets, sign up online, talk to Betsy in the back. We're going to have a, a good old-fashioned kickoff to the school year. We're going to pray for teachers and those who are on the front lines with our students and our kids. Um, and if you're interested in baptism, we would love to talk to you. So you can go online and figure out how to uh, get into baptism, and we'll, we'd love to talk with you. So uh, today, though, we have a special guest speaker, a guy named Steve Leonard. Steve, I've known Steve for about 10 years or so. He was in ministry for about 10 years. He's a really sharp guy. Uh, he's been in the business world the past few years. He's a loving husband. He's a father of two. Uh, he's a pretty normal guy, a good guy who loves Jesus. And we say around here, you know, d discipleship has many faces. So he comes, brings the word, and he, uh, I sat through the first service. It was actually really good. So you're going to enjoy this. But welcome, Steve Leonard. And welcome up. Come on up, Steve. Give him a hand. Thanks, Ben. Did I flip this? Oh, I did flip the switch the right way. That's great. <clears throat> I'm glad that he gave me the recommendation that was actually good. Um, I was waiting. How is he going to, how is he going to say it? No. Um, well, thanks. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here this morning. And uh, yeah, uh, we had a good time for service, and hopefully we can here as well. So um, several years ago, there was uh, a man in the church that I served who just, he blew me away with his, with his discipline, with his spiritual discipline. Uh, I'm going to call him John. Um, John came to faith during his days in the Navy. Uh, through a ministry called Navigators, and um, this is kind of the this is kind of John's sort of like daily routine. So he woke up at 4:30 every day, a.m. Now in the first service, they're like, "A.m. Yeah, I'm up then too." But a.m. folks, 4:30 a.m. Took a three-minute shower. That's true. Uh, had a piece of toast for breakfast and read his Bible for at least 30 minutes. Uh, John had a system of scripture memorization. He was always, always memorizing the Bible, always had something in his pocket that, that he was memorizing. He was a small group Bible study leader, Sunday school teacher, elder at the church. I, I think he did like 12 other things at the church beyond that. Um, he had a system of sharing his faith that he shared with people about how to share their faith. Um, he was, uh, in my mind, he was a Christian machine. Uh, he, he didn't drink, he smoked, or used foul language. He voted for all the right people. He was on the, all the right side of the, like, culture wars. Like, he, he just, he was this remarkable guy. And I, I was a young pastor at the time, and I remember uh, my lead pastor telling me just how much he admired John's discipline, commitment to his faith. 
And if ever, like I know, I know Jesus is the only one who ever like obeyed perfectly. But if ever there was a candidate for somebody that like obeyed God perfect, perfectly, John was the guy. Like he was that guy. But for all John's obedience and all of his close study of scripture and disciplined lifestyle, about 10 years after I left that church, um, I heard something really sad. I heard that John had abandoned his faith. It blew me away. His daughter had raised some intellectual questions that touched his heart. He tried to talk with his daughter about these things, and uh, he wasn't able to come up with answers for himself or for her. And it doesn't really matter for our purposes what the intellectual questions um, were. Um, the, the point is that John was this, the, a picture of what many of us might say is a model of following Jesus. But for all his obedient activity, Ultimately, John confused his moral and religious practice with actually knowing God through Jesus. And as a result, when his daughter came with these serious questions that affected her heart and his heart, he found he didn't have the resources to sustain her or himself. And the truth is, I think we all kind of face the same danger in both big ways and especially in subtle ways in our own lives where we can confuse our moral and religious practice with actually knowing God through Jesus. Now this week, I get to continue our series uh, in Romans 9 to 11, Church for Others. I'm excited to be a part of this, where Paul has been establishing, he establishes two pillar themes that we've been looking at. One is God's sovereignty in salvation, his determining choice and ownership in our salvation. And the second pillar theme is our call to tell others about Christ, the, to live with evangelist, evangelistic passion for others. And over the past couple of weeks, we've seen that Paul is dealing in Romans 9 with the reality that a huge portion of Israel are cut off from Christ, cut off from the God of their fathers. And, you know, it's, it's a problem. Because if you remember, I was here, Romans 8, Remember that Sunday when, uh, when, when Pastor J- uh, Jason read that, that line in Romans 8 where it says, nothing will separate us from the love of, of God. And re- we cried out as a church, I remember, amen. But, but Paul knows there's a problem because the, the issue is he understands the immediate question is, well, if nothing separates us from the love of God, then why has Israel been separated from the love of God? And you can see that's not like a question from back then. That's a real question. Paul understands that, that this, is, this issue is if something separates Israel from the love of God, then what should we worry that something may actually separate us from the love of God? That's the question on the table. And look, in Romans 9 to 11, let's just acknowledge there's a lot of insider baseball going on in there. Paul assumes his readers and hearers that they know Israel's scriptures very, very well, right? There's a lot of, he quotes from, Old Testament, from um, Israel's prophets, he quotes from Israel's history, and he weaves it all together to, to make this case about God's faithfulness through history. But whew, he trusts that we really understand all of this part really, really great. <laughs> so it gets a little complicated sometimes, but if we get lost in the detail, we, we might actually miss how relevant all this is to us, that if God is not prom- faithful to his promises to Israel, then you and I have no basis for trusting that he'll be faithful to us. So over the past few weeks, we've learned a few things. We've learned that God chose us. The children of the promises are the true spiritual children of Abraham, not necessarily those who descend from Abraham by blood. We've learned that there's a God and I am not him and to trust and move forward in my faith even when I don't totally get how God is working and what he's doing. And we've seen that the creator decides the purposes for his creation like a potter with clay. And this morning, we're going to see how Paul handles the next implied question in the text and in his argument. And that question is, what about people who work really hard to practice their faith? What about people who are all in in their faith and from all exterior uh, perspective, they seem like they've really got their faith together. Surely they're good to go. Surely they get in, right? 
But right off the bat, Paul kind of turns our expectations right on their head. Right away, he tells us that God calls the unexpected. God pursues the least expected people. He calls those that you and I would reject. Now, I know we all know Israel's scriptures like as well as Rabbi Paul did. Uh, But for those of you who are like me, most of you, you're not going to need what I'm about to say. But for those of you who are more like me and just need a little bit of reminders, uh, I'm going to just share um, a little refresher that we need to remind ourselves of something very important that Jewish people of Paul's day knew that maybe we don't always remember in the forefront of our minds because they knew the Bible like we know movies. So Jewish people of Paul's day, they knew that God's promise, uh, they knew about God's promise to Abraham to save Israel. Which, by the way, I'll just say now, I'm not used to the little remote, so I'm going to do my best. Ooh, it like buzzed at me. All right, there we go. Cool. <clears throat> We're going to see how this goes. I messed up a little bit in first service. so um, Okay, so that's okay. You can chuckle. It's okay. Uh, oh, there it is. You guys are here. Cool. Um, the Jewish people of Paul's day knew that God's promise to Abraham uh, to save Israel in Genesis 12, where he says this. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this was, this is a huge passage in the Bible. This is a passage that they all knew in the day. And the the issue here, the reason I'm mentioning it is because the Israelites, they focused in and they really understood that they were blessed by God. They were called to be, they were blessed by God. They were his chosen people in Abraham. But the problem is they focused on themselves as the objects of God's blessing because they're they're Abraham's descendants. They kind of counted on that. They focused on on themselves as God's chosen people. And there's so much in in the scriptures where we can see that the Jewish people, and we know from history as well, that the Jewish people, they actually longed for God's judgment on the nations, God's judgment on the Gentiles, because they were God's people. And those people deserved God's judgment. But Paul knows the scriptures very, very well. And he reminds them and us that God actually always intended to call the Gentiles to himself. And so that's why referring to the, to, uh, the vessels of mercy, which he has pre- prepared beforehand in glory, that's in verse 23. He goes on to say in verse 24 that uh, the vessels of mercy include both Jews and Gentiles. So he says in verse 24, even us whom he has called. Who's us, Paul? Not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. That would not have gone over especially great for some people in Paul's day. And Paul's saying here that God called all of us as God's chosen, both Jewish people and Gentile alike, together. That that Israel didn't expect it, but God always intended to save the Gentiles. Paul reminds them of God's promise to Abraham was not only to be blessed— but to be blessed in order to be a blessing. That God, in that promise inherently, was that they would bless the whole world. It's right there in the text. But they forgot. And so he goes to the prophet Hosea, which is where you and I would go if we were going to make this point. We would just think, well, you know, Hosea, let's go there. Right? One of the prophets' names is Hosea, and it's one of the books. And anyway. Um, Again, you can laugh. It's okay. Um, now I see why Pastor Jason does that when he's up here. <laughs> um, so he goes to Hosea, and he shows that this has been God's plan all along. So in verses, oh, it's up there already. Okay, in verses 25 and 26, he says, As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place Where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. Now, Hosea is talking about the impending Assyrian invasion to the northern tribe of Israel. But what Paul sees in this this moment is he sees that, that God shows anyone his mercy that he chooses. 
That whether it's people who have left him, like in the case of historical Israel, or whether it's those who never knew him, like the Gentiles, the people that we don't expect, God shows his mercy. And that God, in doing that, turns the rejected people, those that we would overlook, into sons and daughters of the living God. Now, I, I wonder, as you and I hear that God calls the least expected, I, I, I wonder how that hits us. Like, it's one thing to talk about how the Jewish people in Paul's day, like, waiting for God to judge the Gentiles, were learn, you know, were, were, how they were shocked to learn that, that God planned to include the least expected, the, the God-defying Gentiles. But we're here at GBC, 2,000 years later, right here in this very room, because God's plan was to include the least expected. Those God-defying Gentiles, you and me, well, at least most of us. But what the Jewish people missed about the character of God is that God is always looking. He is always on the lookout for those who don't have it together. God is always looking for those society rejects. From the first pages of Genesis to the last pages of Revelation, God has pursued his creation through his people to bless the whole world. That is the story of the Bible. God watches for the widow and the orphan and the slave and the prisoner. He listens to the sinner, to the outcast, to those who have been hurt by people claiming his name. He turns his face towards them. He reaches out and touches the untouchable like Jesus with the leper. That they might experience adoption and be called sons and daughters of the living God. Israel missed how incredibly reckless God is with his love. And I wonder, I wonder if we ever miss how reckless God is with his love. Do we ever look at, at others and have even, even a hunch in some small place inside of us that when it comes to God, those people, whoever those people are for you, those people, when it comes to God, they don't get it. They won't get it. They can't get it. Look, we live in really contentious times. We, li we, li like, we live in crazy times. I was a pastor for 10 years, but I've been out of it through all the events of the last crazy, unprecedented, insane years. Um, thank you, Lord. And I've talked to a number of pastor friends. They've, they've kind of told me what's you know, gone on over, over the last few years in churches. And they tell me that they've experienced in their churches all the same conflicts that our broader culture has experienced. And they've told me that it's like all over the same issues and it's all in the same way, in the same spirit. Yikes. That's really hard. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us that the love of the Father abides in us. This, this love that seeks out the unexpected, this deep, seeking, abiding, adopting love of the Father abides in us. And Jesus tells us that as a result, the world will know that we are his followers by our good theology. He tells us the world will know that we are his followers by our awesome worship music. I've been playing in the worship band a little bit, so it's no condemnation. He tells us that they will know we are Christians because we're on the right side of the culture wars. No. No. It's none of those things. And, and many more that we care about. He tells us they will know that we are his followers by our love. And especially for one another. Because if we have that deep, seeking, abiding love of the Father in us, it will spill out. I mean, when you have a cup and you fill it and it keeps getting filled, eventually that cup spills over. Do you think God's love can more than fill us? 
That's what he's getting at when he tells us that. Now, I don't know who it is for you. I don't know who you have a hard time loving. People from the other political party, maybe. People from another socioeconomic status. I know none of us have issues loving people, other people from, you know, different race and gender, because that's just stuff in the media and on Twitter that's not in the human heart and certainly not in this room, not you and me. But Maybe it's just a simple, annoying coworker or, or a, a domineering boss or an irritating family member. I don't know. But do you see our two pillars coming out here that God's sovereignty in salvation, that God pursues the least expected, those that we would reject, that's God's sovereignty. And that the result of that is for us to have an evangelistic passion for others, to live wanting to share that love with others. It's bubbling out as we look at this in our own lives, not only in Paul's day, but in, in ours. And I can tell you, I don't know who it is for you that it's hard for you to love. I, I can tell you, for me, I've got people in every one of those categories. I struggle with all of it. I wish I was a better human being, but I'm not. <laughs> I struggle to love people in the way I want to be loved, and especially people different from me. But this text shows us God's character through history is to seek and call to himself the least expected, those we reject. And I, I really believe if we could grasp this morning that God calls the least expected and those we overlook, including ourselves, by the way, and calls us his beloved children, sons and daughters of the living God. Just let that sink in. Sons and daughters of the living God. If we could internalize this and live out of this story, world, watch out. Like you get how much we live out of the wrong story? This is the story. And we could probably stop here because this is enough for us to like chew on for a while, I think, and let God get a hold of us. But don't worry, I got more to come. Unfortunately, and it's important, because unfortunately, not only does God call the least expected, but he also knows that we need a warning, that God's people need a warning, because God also rejects the most expected. God denies those who presume on him, those who try to deserve and earn and prove their righteousness, who think that they're good to go with God so they can kind of assume that in their lives. That does not go well. Paul turns from Hosea to Isaiah to warn Israel God will not allow his people to presume on God. Israel forgot their God. They followed other gods. They stopped paying attention to the God who delivered them from slavery in Egypt. They thought, we're God's chosen people, so we're good. And along comes Isaiah. And he calls them out, and he says, Make sure I get this up here. Oh, I missed that one, sorry. <clears throat> he says, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. Now, that, that's powerful, because remember, God promised that Abraham's children would be like the sand, number like the sand, but sea. Then he says, even if they are, only a remnant will be saved. Whew. Now, this is, again, the historical setting here is, again, that, that now the southern kingdom of Judah is about to get beat up on and, and, and conquered by Assyria. Most of them killed. Those that live, most of them go into exile. But God promises that he will preserve a remnant to Israel. And he goes on to, to, um, to assert that, Paul goes on to assert that, the, that this kind of confusing verse that God is effective, thorough, and swift in accomplishing his word, no matter how confusing it looks. So in verse 28, he says, the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. See, the point here is that God works in unexpected ways, but he is faithful to his promises. And then he goes on to make clear that even this remnant is only the result of God's mercy and love, not because of Israel. They can't bank on being God's chosen people, so they're good to go. It's because of God's mercy. And so he says very clearly in verse 29, he says, and as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts has not 
had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. That's code for if it weren't for God just being purely gracious to us, we would have been wiped out. Right? Remember the question, if God's not faithful to Israel, will he be faithful to us? God in his mercy nevertheless preserves a remnant. It's not the way they thought it would look, but God is faithful. So here's the issue. Prior to the Assyrian invasion and Israel's exile, exile, Israel had grown far from God. And that's, that is the story of Israel's scriptures. God's chosen people moving further and further and further away from God. Like that is the story of, 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 the, of um, Israel's scriptures. It's not a story. It's not a book full of a bunch of like heroes of the faith with great moral examples that we can follow. It's, it's, a, it's a story of God in his mercy and love pursuing his wayward people over and over and over and over again to bring about something that we as humans, man, we're fantastic at, at resisting and rejecting. And when the remnant returned in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, they kind of realized, man, a couple generations ago, they really messed up and they got us exiled and now God's bringing us back to land. We got to do something different. So they, they kind of dig into the Bible again and they start setting up rules around the Bible so that people will break those rules and not the Bible rules. And then they put rules around those rules so that there's like, they keep making this like buffer and they set up this whole kind of big religious system so that they're like good with God and they know everything's set. And it's that, that is what Jesus condemns in the, in the gospels over and over again. That's what Paul is picking on the Jewish Christians for in Romans. You can't just be religious like that. Israel went about it all wrong. They pursued God by works. They tried to prove to God they're worthy and deserve to be God's people. They're not like the Gentiles who worship false gods and live immoral lives and are not chosen by God, those dirty Gentiles. And that's why he says in verse 32, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. So it's kind of like this. <laughs> Poor little one. It's all good. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> it's like this. As Paul's talking about Israel, he kind of says, you know, it's, it, it's like a husband who like learns that his wife uh, is not real happy with their relationship. So, you know, the husband, he thinks, I'm going to fix this. So without talking to her, he, <clears throat> thanks, I knew you'd get there. He, you know, he's like, all right, I'm going to take care of this. So he starts, um, he, you know, he makes sure that his secretary buys her flowers every week for him to take home. Every now and again, he buys them himself, you know. He makes sure to do the dishes, takes out the trash. He, uh, you know, he makes sure to fill up her car with gas and clean it so that it's ready to go whenever she uses it. And on and on and on. He does all these amazing things. The only challenge is every time they sit down on the couch in the evening to, you know, finally like connect and she leans over to talk to him, share her day, hear about his, she finds there he is on, on you know, asleep. There's no reason that I can do that position really naturally and easily. Um, she can't hear, she doesn't get to hear about him and how he's doing and what's going on with him. And so while he's got all this activity going on, while he's doing all these deeds, he's doing all these things, what he's, what he's missing is there's, there, there's no vulnerability, there's no intimacy, there's no relationship. And I'm talking about Israel and God, but married folk, where you find the illustration applies, you know, I recommend you, you know, maybe consider talking to somebody and getting some help for your relationship because, you know, that would be good. Um, but here's the deal. The Bible, it's not about morality. Like, the Bible's clear. According to the Bible, we don't, we don't have a moral problem. That's not what we're trying to solve. So we can't obey our way to God. 
That's, that's one of the issues. We don't have a knowledge problem. It's not that we don't know enough, so if we learn enough and have enough knowledge that we can like know enough to be good with God. That's not the problem. The problem is, the issue is, the Bible is about the living God and his relationship with his people. We have a relational problem. And that's why God rejects those we often most expect to be good to go with God. Because we think that there's some way that we can perform and be okay. Like when I went off to seminary, I loved God. I was eager to learn how to study the Bible. And I just, I knew the more I studied and the more I learned and the more I knew, the closer I'd be to God. Even more, I knew that once I became a full-time pastor, I'd reach this like new level in my relationship with God. And so I studied hard in seminary. But I found it was easier to focus on knowledge and information than to engage wholeheartedly with God. And that in some ways they're just two different things. As a pastor, I had counseling appointments and sermons to write and programs to plan and budgets to manage and meetings to attend and weddings and funerals to perform, people to visit in the hospital, strategic planning, one-on-one meetings, and more. That's all the stuff your pastors have to do too. It's so fun to be able to say things when I'm not a pastor now. (laughs) I was devoted to my activity to God. But neither seminary nor being a pastor in and of itself actually brought me any closer to God himself. It's like, it's a myth. I was like the husband doing all the things for the wife without actually having a relationship. And those of us in the church, we need to pay attention to passages like these, I think. Being an elder, sitting on the board of a Christian organization, playing in the worship team, singing in the choir, being a Sunday school teacher, and on and on and on. We might be tempted to think it means that we're good to go with God. But the Bible's full of warnings that God wants our hearts, not our sacrifices. We might be tempted to assume because we're here this morning that we're good, that we're in with God, but just God is not interested in religious people. It's just not where it's at. So God calls the least expected, but he also rejects the most expected. So kind of what are we to do? Where, does he, where, where do we go from here? Well, God, Paul tells us, welcomes our hearts and not our religion. God wants our core. He wants our essence, not the ticking of boxes. So Paul asked the question in his listeners' minds, well, okay, so how did the Gentiles who don't know God and don't live by God's law become God's beloved children? Israel tried so hard, even making rules around God's law so they wouldn't break God's law, and God rejects Israel and accepts the Gentiles? Like, in our words, it's not fair. It's not right. They're trying so hard, and then he goes with these other people? I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a real question. And so he gives us some insight, starting in verse 30. He says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law, would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. So he uses this, this metaphor, Paul, in, in, the word pers- in the word pursue, to liken all this to a race. So if we, can, if we can kind of paraphrase Paul, what he's saying is essentially this. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who don't even run the race, they don't even get dressed for it. They win. <laughs> and the Israelites who like, they train, they go into wind tunnels, they like dial everything in, they work hard, they race their little hearts out. They don't even finish the race what the heck? That's what he's saying in this, in, in, in this verse. How does that work? Israel tried to prove their worth to God through their religion. That's the problem. The Gentiles, they believed God when they were introduced to Jesus. That's what it's saying. They got a righteousness by faith. They believed, they trusted, they heard, they listened, they responded. Where Israel tried to prove and work and and demonstrate and, and presumed on God. The one thing Israel missed in their relationship with God was to have a relationship with God. <laughs> I 
And that's why when Jesus came, they missed him. They had so much teaching about Messiah, who he was supposed to be, where he was supposed to be from, where he was supposed to be like, what he was supposed to do, that when they met the real Jesus, their theology had no room for him. I mean, you know, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, for us, with our, with our theology and our understanding, like, is it possible that if God, like, ever showed up in the room, that, that, like, he wouldn't fit our theology and we wouldn't have room for God himself? I mean, it's a question we should ask from time to time. You know, we don't just read the Bible. We need to let it read us and reshape us. And that's true whether we're trying to figure out who God is in the first place, whether we're brand new following him, or whether we've been following him for decades. The Gentiles, what about the Gentiles? Well, many Gentiles heard about Jesus and they just believed who he said he was. And in fact, there's this major theme in the, in the gospel accounts where we see both Israel, Israel and, and the Gentiles interacting with Jesus and responding. And those who have God figured out, those who really understand the Bible really, really well, they get rebuked every time. Every time. 100%. Those who have no clue who are just desperate and needy and longing and just looking for like love and mercy and grace, every time they receive it, every time. So those, it's the needy and the immoral and the hurting and the mar marginalized, they respond by trusting in Jesus. And so that's why in verse 32, he says, the end of verse 32, he says, they have stumbled over a stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Gosh, you hear how that hits the question, is God faithful to his promises? Those who believe in him will not be put to shame. Israel tried to justify themselves. The Gentiles trusted Jesus to justify them. Israel had religion. The Gentiles had relationship with Jesus. Israel put up barriers with God that blocked them from him, and as a result, they missed God and missed telling others about him. They failed to open their hearts to God's blessing. They failed to open their hearts to be a blessing to others. So I, I think this is all pretty applicable to us in our own lives today. See, God welcomes all of us when we listen to him and believe him. And God wants us to share the welcoming God with all. He welcomes all of us when we listen to him. Look, in, in all these things, I, I think one of the huge issues is fear. One of the number one like barriers we're up against is fear. When we're driven by a fear of failing God, fear of what's happening in the world, fear of others, fear of God himself, and on and on and on, we find ways to prove ourselves and posture ourselves and protect ourselves. We live in seriously fear-filled days. Fear is like in the air. Gen Z, one of the number one uh, characteristics of Gen Z is that they are anxious. Anxiety and fear have a pretty strong relationship. And you know what the biblical opposite of fear is? It's love. It's love. 1 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And that's what the Gentiles, that's what they, that's what they get right. That's what needy, desperate, marginalized people tend to get right. When we encounter Jesus himself and our heavenly papa and we listen to the Holy Spirit, we turn from fear to love. Love for God, love for others, love for the world. We get filled up and it spills out. And when we love, we trust, we believe. One of the key things, uh, uh, one of the key issues in, in, in the Bible, you know, we see the word obedience a lot. It's not my favorite word because we think of, we think of that in like military terms. But the, the word in Hebrew, it's, it's, uh, it's to, to listen. It's to hear. We're not, we're not God's soldiers that like we're meant to like obey because, you know, we're trying to perform military, you know, stuff. 
We're his children. We're meant to listen to our dad. <laughs> meant to hear that he loves us and that, and that that love has implications. Because God wants our hearts, not our religion. He wants our hearts because we are his beloved children. I spend myself way too much time living like an orphan, trying to prove myself to God, to others, to myself. I thought by attending seminary and working as a pastor, I thought I would like show my God, my, my devotion to God and get really close to him. I'm learning, I do not have it figured out, I'm learning to hear my heavenly father's voice and to receive the truth that I am his beloved son. It reduces my anxiety in life and it opens me up to receive his love and to love others. Now, I don't know what you fear and where you need Papa's love to penetrate your life, but it will open you up to love as well. God wants us also to share this welcoming God with all. When we begin to love, we're empowered to share God's love with others. God is sovereign in salvation. He calls the least expected and rejects the most expected. And to the degree that that causes us any concern, when we know we are loved, we can honestly, without any agenda, share God's love in Jesus with others. It can be a natural outpouring of God's love in us. I was challenged by a mentor of mine once to listen to, to, to really listen to God's spirit, to, to, to be attentive to his direction. And if God is God and I'm not him and he, and he calls the unexpected, he just may whisper to me something outside my comfort zone. He may lead me to let that love pour out in ways that Ooh, I wouldn't choose to do. <laughs> I kind of do this better and worse at times. But this text, it's full of hard things. And one thing we know is that Paul's passion for the salvation of his rejected brethren is to share the gospel. He, he wants to see them saved. He is willing to do that at any cost, even his own salvation. That's how radical, that's how reckless the love of God is. And Paul understands that. And that's why he says in chapter 10, verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. He says, it's not fair my people are rejected, but his response to share the love of Christ as far and as long as he can. We may feel it's unfair that God, it's God's choice and not ours, but if we listen to his voice and we trust our daddy in heaven, we might also be driven to share God's love in Jesus and share it with others in both word and deed. So to just bring us to an end here, my friend John, he was a picture of what a lot of us might say is like a, a model of following Jesus. But for all his obedient activity, all of his deeds, John confused his moral and religious practice with actually knowing God through Jesus. Israel made that same mistake. I think if we're honest, again, sometimes in big ways, but probably more often in subtle ways, we can be guilty of the same thing. And so Paul comes and he tells us here that that the good news is that God calls the, the least expected. He rejects the most expected. And he wants our hearts and not a religion. And that's where it's at. God's sovereign mercy compels us to receive and share God's unexpected love. Amen to that? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, if, if we're honest, we recognize that, uh, Lord, we, we do presume upon you at times. That, Lord, we, it's easy to allow subtle ways to creep in that we think that we're good to go because of the way we serve you or because we attend church or many, many things.
Sometimes it's even just we think that we believe the right things and so we're set. But Father, you just, you want so much more from us than that. You want our hearts. Not because you're a demanding father, but because you're a loving father. And you know what we need. You know where we're desperate. You know the holes in our lives that you can fill. And you know the beautiful and amazing and empowered life that you call us to in you. So Father, speak to us. Lord, work in our hearts. We give you thanks for your sovereign mercy, for your call on our lives to wildly share that mercy, for your reckless love that we can receive and that we can share. It's in your name we pray, amen. We're gonna close today with a time of thanksgiving through worship and through the taking of the elements. We do communion together. It's called the Eucharist. It means giving thanks. It's a meal of thanksgiving that God has decided to commune with you. And I love that even as Christ sits with his friends who are about to leave him and betray him, he still gives himself for them. And so today the invitation for you, for me, is not a religious performance for God. It's simply, as Steve said, this is about recognizing who God is for you and that he's for you because he's good in Christ. So we're going to pass out the elements, we're going to sing and hold on to the bread, and we will break it together.
on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he looked his friends in the eyes. He said, this is my body, it's broken for you. He still does the same for you and for me. And with that, we take and we eat. also took a cup of wine he gave it to his friends he told them that it was his blood shed for them we're going to pass the cup and I encourage you you have a moment with God he's always listening maybe speaking to you but give thanks and hold the cup and as we worship and together we'll drink Take that cup and together let us stand, stand together. Again, as we do this, a symbol of God's heart, his full heart for you and for me, relentless, his grace, his compassion, his love, his desire, 
So as we drink this cup, would our hearts meet his, not just as an act or a symbol, but something that's happening within us. Take and drink the cup together. As God's body, as his church, and sing these words. each other each week who we are in Christ and the point is not that it would stay here the point is that you would walk with God throughout this week remembering who he is in your life and how he loves you if you want to talk more about Jesus I'd love to talk with you we're also gonna have friends up here that would love to pray with you whether it's sickness whether it's mental health whether it's a kid anything that you have prayer for we would love to pray with you and for you because we need to take care of each other. And with that, just a blessing on you as you go out. Remember how much God has loved you. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.
Take courage again.